Okay, hello chaps and chapettes. This is Scaramouche speaking and uh, I missed last week because of a few things that was going on trying to do. Okay, let's be honest. I was uh, a little bit slow on my studying uh, the week previous. So I have basically studied two chapters this week, um, almost back to back. Uh, so it's uh, been a bit rocky, but I've managed to get through it. I'm back up to date now. So this video, I'm going to tell you about Mary Wollstonecraft, who was in chapter five. Um, and then I'm going to stop this video when I've done it, start a new one up and tell you about Charles Dickens. So I am still going to separate these into two separate videos. Um, I'm sorting a few things out at the moment, so if I'm doing stuff while I'm telling you about the video, I'm just multitasking, I know blokes aren't supposed to do it, maybe that's a little bit uh, the wrong thing to say uh, when it uh, comes to Mary Wollstonecraft uh, because of the equals gender thing that she believed in, but hey hey, so that is the lady herself, as you can see. Mary Wollstonecraft. So in the video that I did a couple of weeks ago, I told you a little bit about what I knew about her and learnt a lot more since then. Um, so a brief summary of her life. She was uh, born to a mother who I don't believe lasted in the world that long and a father who was an abusive. He did have some money behind him and um, from his father. His father was a uh, industrialist, um, had a, uh, a bit of money, but that went to his brother, I believe. He didn't get a cent and that was because, or a dime or a penny, or whichever it was in those days. Um, so, he didn't get the inheritance from his father that went to his brother and I believe that was because he was already a drunk and alcoholic abusive at that time and he just wasn't seen fit to take on the company from his father. So growing up Mary Wollstonecraft had a very difficult childhood, um, didn't have the best of father, was moving about quite a lot, uh, usually to avoid uh, certain bankruptcies, which at the time bankruptcy held the um, charge of going to prison. And uh, you'll find out more about that when we come to Charles Dickens as well. So uh, she had a very rough childhood. When she was of age, uh, she was trying to support her siblings and also get a job, get a role for herself. Uh, she settled on a, a governess in a household for a while in Ireland, where the family, although they were good to her, they paid her money, she did see a lot of the opulent wealth compared to the poverty that she'd been living in previously and saw the way they squandered it, the way um, in particular, that the children of the household were educated and that led her into a connection with the reformists at the time, um, the enlightened, um, enlightened the, uh, it was called the enlightenment at the, the time of um, the period that Mary was growing up and living in. And the enlightenment was uh, gentlemen and uh, some ladies who wanted to move away from the monarchy. You've probably heard stories uh, similar to it, um, such as like Guy Fawkes and, and that sort of kind of thing. There was a bit of that going on, but in particular, they were seeing the revolutions that were taking place in America and in France and they wanted a revolution of their own, um, not to the violent extent that uh, those two uh, places 
had, but they still wanted to move from an aristocracy that ruled over everything, that held the power of the vote and the uh, church and that kind of thing, to a more equal state. And Mary got involved in that. Um, she moved on from being a governess in the family and uh, went on to start writing, um, publishing some of the reformist and rebel um, views and uh, she eventually w w started to get published and I don't believe, although I don't know, it wasn't something that I read, but I wouldn't have believed she would have used her full name because that would have still been seen as a bit um, difficult at that time for her um, being a woman. And that's what we kind of come on to in this bit because she supported the views of um, many of the writers and educated that at that time and uh, wanted the aristocracy to move on um, or move aside so that everybody got an equal right. But she saw in a lot of these writers and rebels that a lot of the views, a lot of the um, reasons, the arguments that they had was for rich versus poor or um, that's not for me <laughs> yet. Um, but she didn't see any rights for women. So she did a bit of uh, reading up, found a, an author that she liked called um, Rossio, and found that he wrote a book called um, A Meal, which followed the ideas of this fictional imaginary child uh, growing up and um, going through a, a a better time for them where they all got um, the equal rights that they deserved and tried to show that it wouldn't turn a human to become a um, an, an, arse, an, an anarchist. Um, but the last chapter of that, uh, of Emile, had the subject's character, Mary, and she found that in this, this character that was created, Sophie, who Emile married, she was still uh, submissive. She was still looking up to the husband. The husband's role was to be active and strong and powerful, whereas Sophie's role was to obey her husband. And she disagreed with that. So she'd written, by this point, the... Uh, vindication of man which was about the vindication of the uh, the rights for all humans but then she moved on to the vindication of the rights of women which uh, focused on a lot of uh, Rossier's points and tried to correct them and a lot of those points that were that she wanted to correct were things like the belief that um, women were naturally um, submissive and that they were grown to um, naturally obey the man and to be in this sort of uh, wishy-washy way that they were forced to grow up and she pointed out the fact that if a woman isn't grown up isn't educated to believe that that nature is natural then she will so seek a different path so she pointed out that things like children who grow up with mirrors and um, dolls and this, that and the other aren't really um, given the chance to also look at books and to educate themselves and to learn to follow, to find new paths. And those views were read and they weren't necessarily disregarded. She did have publications that said that it wasn't quite correct that she um, she should have said those things, but she did also have a lot of supporters in her reformist friends and um, in other areas of the Enlightenment who believed in her ideas. So 
so she did become popular. Then she went on, uh, she had a, a very difficult life in the fact that she went to France to try and help and to support the women over there um, during the time of the French Revolution. But when she went over, the French Revolution was becoming something much darker, which was called the Terror. And the Terror was a time when the revolutionists had gotten into um, more power and were therefore trying to depose anybody, whether it was a prime minister or a, um, a, a aristocrat, um, anybody who had unjust power, they wanted to depose. And uh, there was a lot of murder and death and destruction that took place uh, in that time. And anybody who was a foreigner, apart from Americans, and we'll get to that bit, um, who came across, was seen as trying to sway the balance and support the um, support the order as it had been. So a lot of Mary Wollstonecraft's friends did pass away and were killed, um, either hung or beheaded, um, because simply because they were in the country when they shouldn't have been. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Um, so that uh, became, so she was caught up in that and could very easily have lost her life then if it wasn't for a man called, um, I think it was Gregory, uh, give me a moment, I think it was George, um, George Inlam. Um, give me a moment there and I'll just double check. Um, but she met this, this, uh, American and, um, she did fall in love with him. Um, she did have a relationship with him and she also had a child with him. Um, Gilbert Imlay was his name. So she did fall in love with him, but their relationship was also built on the fact that she needed to get out of the country and Americans who had been through a revolution were seen as popular in France because they were seen as not, not um, people who were coming over to try and sway the balance in any sort of way. So they were celebrated when they came over and um, and respected. So by saying, and it has been um, suggested that Wollstonecraft never really married Imlay, but said so. In fact, in her letters, I believe she pleaded for him to um, marry him later on, once they had gone out of the country. But she, um, they pretended to be married so that they could get out of the country and get to safety. Um, so they, they got back to England and then Imlay found himself another woman and left Wollstonecraft and um, left her in a very um, desolate and lonely place. She became highly suicidal. She tried to take her own life twice. Uh, the first time it's believed it was just a cry for help. The second time was really a, a proper attempt to, to take her own life because she um, she jumped off a bridge and was luckily dragged out of the river and uh, revived. But um, she did go through a very, very dark time in her life. And it's not hard to believe considering she'd lost friends, she'd seen all that terror and bloodshed, fallen in love with somebody who didn't love her back, had a child that was uh, basically a bastard. And um, then was and then lost her her way a lot, um, and it was only thanks to her friends, her um, enlightenment friends, who came to her aid and tried to insist that she got back to the thing that she most loved and started writing again. That she started to feel more comfortable in her situation and that's when she met William Godfrey 
Uh, I'm going to double check that name as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've got that name right. No, Godwin. I'm sure it's Godwin. It was a week. <laughs> Give me a chance. I've been learning Dickens this whole time. Um, but she met William Godwin and she did fall head over heels for him. And um, they were both reformists. So they both believed in marriage that was uh, very different to conventions. And in that sense, uh, they both were um, very much um, very close to each other. Yes, it was William Godwin. And uh, even though they had little arguments and discussions, which sometimes took the form of letters, they still believed in the same goals and followed the same paths. And um, they got married. Once... Um, once that relationship had uh, blossomed, they were, um, they found that Mary was pregnant again. She uh, was very happy at this point in her life. She was working on the vindication of women um, as a republish, uh, republish um, story. So she was trying to go through and tidy up some of the um, arguments and um, discussions that she had the the reasoning um for why uh the treatment of women and the education of women should change um but then she had her second child which was mary shelley who was the author of frankenstein and um unfortunately she had an infection um at the point of giving birth which didn't go away. And a few days after having her second daughter, she did pass away. So she lived an incredible life. And you can see why she was such an incredible character to make, quite an inspirational person to most women. Unfortunately, after she passed away, her reputation went downhill and she'd been very careful with her reputation she'd been very um she'd been focused on keeping a lot of the details such as her suicide such as Imlay, such as chasing after a, a man who was already married and that kind of thing and she'd been very careful to keep all of that to herself unfortunately when she passed away uh godwin who was absolutely besotted by her um, wanted to do something to try and preserve her memory. So he wrote this really touching um, memorial about her um, in the form of a book um, because they were both writers. He was a publisher as well, um, which was read. And a lot of people, he, because he believed she would have wanted um, her truth to be known, um, he made it a warts and all biography biography of uh, of uh, Wollstonecraft and people read it and were disgusted by her from that point on they um absolutely um destroyed her her memory they took her books off of um, print they uh, slandered her name at every opportunity calling her a a prostitute and a devil woman and uh, writing nasty poems and things about her and so her reputation and this is the reason why you've probably never heard of her if this is the first time hearing of her because her reputation just went completely out the window and was destroyed um almost to the point of it not existing at all <laughs> there's a few reasons why it does exist um to this day and some of those reasons lie on Mary Shelley. Now, if you've read or you've watched any films about Frankenstein um, and his monster, because obviously Frankenstein is the doctor who created the monster, or the creature, it's not really called a monster, um, then you might be well known, to, you might well know the, uh, the story. But what you might not realise is that at the time of writing that, um, Shelley, who... I believe it was 19 writing Frankenstein, so I've got to get a crack on. <laughs> um, 
she uh, was reading her mother's work. She was reading um, the Vindication of the Rights for Women. And so she was very in tune of what her mother was um, thinking and feeling. She didn't necessarily believe all of the points. And uh, so when you see Frankenstein's monster, it's not necessarily a, um, a woman or a, uh, a man. It's an amalgamation of the two. And it's very confused with its identity. And some believe, because this isn't stated by Shelley herself, um, some believe that that's Shelley's way of saying, this is what my mother was aiming to, um, to create. And it's not necessarily good or bad. It's a bit of a mixture of the two. So you see this monster confused with its identity, um, trying to find a wife, and then when it does uh, meet people, it's hated, it's, uh, disg it's disgusted, and um, it eventually uh, moves away, wondering what it is and why it exists and uh, what is the point of it. And it doesn't really have a, a true ending there either. So part of that is Shelley's way of, of trying to understand that. But the reason why Wollstonecraft is important today is because we do have more riots, we do have more um, opportunities, but there are still areas that need development. Um, for example, in, in science, there's still this, this kind of discussion of whether because women have uh, different ba brains to men, whether they can still accomplish tasks in this way and that way. And sometimes those questions are, are forced away because people believe that they're just not right. So either uh, don't agree with the religion that they believe in, or they don't agree on a scientific level or a humanity level that it's the right question to be asking. So a lot of the things that she came up with are still relevant today. And um, she was a really interesting character to study. I think the things that I'll take away from it is that you never really know what's around the corner and you just have to fight for what you believe in and not really let anybody change your mind because there's still a lot to discover in this world. We've discovered a lot already, but there's still lots more to understand and to change. So that's Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, I'm going to have a quick drink of my tea and then I will uh, crack on with telling you about Charles Dickens. Um, brilliant, brilliant chapter. Um, as all have been really, I've really enjoyed this study. I'm coming to the end of it almost. I've got to decide what I'm doing at Christmas because uh, after Dickens this week I've got um, Van Gogh and... Uh, that's going to be exciting for me. Um, and then I've got the next assignment. Oh, that's what's changed. Shall I tell you? I'm going to tell you in the next video what's changed. Um, because I've had my markings back for my other assignment. But when I was doing Mary Wollstonecraft, I hadn't had those markings back yet. So I'll save that for Dickens. Um, but thank you for watching. The question this week based on Mary Wollstonecraft um, I feel should be more about the uh, the fact that she went through so much and then um, nearly lost her path and eventually was able to change. And also when you see, um, like I've, I've said with Mary Shelley, she was writing Frankenstein and had some very important views there and wasn't quite sure whether to, to change those views or not. As, it seemed to reflect in the, the book. So my idea, my question to you this week is, what would you change or should you change? And do you think it would be positive if you did? And for me, one of the important things that I find and does come up in Christmas Carol as well, is this idea that there's a lot of greed and uh, want in the world that, um, and I'm not talking about on like a political level, although that's that's part of it, 
there's a lot of I should have this and I don't and there's a lot of belief um, in this world today where we feel like we were uh, it's our God given right or our birthright to have certain rights and certain things and sometimes that is right and sometimes it's wrong and uh, the times when it's wrong is usually because it's more we're not asking what's right for people we're asking what's right for me and I think yes you should look after yourself this is a bit of a rambling point of view we should look after ourselves, but we should also look after our fellow people and I don't think we do enough so should it change should we look after ourselves more than everybody else personally as the person I am, I feel the people outside of us are more important. And if we just spent a bit more time just looking at each other and just saying, right, they've not got a pair of shoes. If I just give them a £10 pair of shoes, then they'll be fine. It might make the world a better place. Or it might make people greedy. I don't know. But it's what I believe in. So thank you for watching my video. Um, like and subscribe if this interests you, if you want to see more. I'm going to have a quick pause and then go on to talk about Charles Dickens. I will be posting this on YouTube as I do so. Enjoy and toodaloo!